The Autobiography of C. H. Spurgeon's Chapter 12 Letters to Father and Mother, January to June, 1850 In Anne's private letters often let you into the secrets of his heart. Read Rutherford's letters, and you will see the man at once, of those of Kirk, White, or Newton. A man's writing desk should be used to make his biography, C. H. S. New Market, January 30th, 1850 My dear father, I am now most happy and comfortable. I could not be more so while sojourning on earth, like a pilgrim or a stranger, as all my families were. There are but four boarders and about twelve day boys. I have a nice little mathematics class and have quite as much time for study as I had before. I can get good religious conversation with Mr. Swindell, which is what I most need. Oh, how unprofitable has my past life been. Oh, that I should have been so long time blind to those celestial wonders, which now I can in a measure behold. Who can refrain from speaking of the marvelous love of Jesus, which I hope has opened mine eyes? Now I see him. I can firmly trust to him for my eternal salvation. Yet soon I doubt again. Then I am sorrowful. Again faith appears, and I become confident of my interest in him. I feel now as if I could do everything and give up everything for Christ, and then I know it would be nothing in comparison with his love. I am hopeless of ever making anything like a return. How sweet is prayer. I would be always engaged in it. How beautiful is the Bible. I never loved it so before. It seems to me as necessary food. I feel that I have not one particle of spiritual life in me, but that the Spirit placed there. I feel that I cannot live if he depart. I tremble and fear lest I should grieve him. I dread lest sloth of pride should overcome me, and I should dishonor the gospel by neglect of prayer or the scriptures or by sinning against God. Truly, that will be a happy place where we shall get rid of sin and this depraved, corrupt nature. When I look at the horrible pit in the hole from which I have been digged, I tremble lest I should fall into it and yet rejoice that I am on the king's highway. I hope you will forgive me for taking up so much space about myself, but at present my thoughts are most about it. From the scriptures, it is not apparent that immediately upon receiving the Lord Jesus, it is, all, it is a part of duty openly to profess him. I firmly believe and consider that baptism is a command of Christ, and shall not feel quite comfortable if I do not receive it. I am unworthy of such things, but so am I unworthy of Jesus' love. I hope I have received the blessing of the one, and think I ought to take the other also. My very best love to you and my dear mother. I seem to love you more than ever because you loved my you love my Lord Jesus. I hope yourself, dear mother, Archer, Isa, Emily, Louisa, and Lottie are well. Love to all. May we all, after this fighting life is over, meet in that kingdom of immense delight where health and peace and joy unite, where undeclining pleasures rise and every wish hath full supplies. And while you are here, may the blessings of the gospel abound towards you. And may we as a family be all devoted to the Lord. May all blessings be upon us, and may I ever remain your dutiful and affectionate son, Charles H. Spurgeon. New Market, February 19, 1850. My dear mother, may I hope the long space between my letters will be excused, as I assure you I am fully occupied. I read French exercises every night with Mr. Swindell. Monsignor Perret comes once every week for an hour. I have 33 houses at present where I did tracks. I happen to take a district formerly supplied by Mrs. Andrews, who last lived in this house, and Miss Anna Swindell. Next Wednesday, I mean tomorrow, I am going to go to a meeting of the tract distributors. They have been at a standstill and hope now to start afresh. On Thursday, Mr. Simpson intends coming to talk with me about the most important of all subjects. Oh, how I wish that I could do something for Christ. Tract distribution is so pleasant and easy that it is a nothing, nothing in itself, much less when it is compared with the amazing debt of gratitude I owe. I have written to Grandfather and have received a very nice letter. I have been in the mire, sloth, and despond. He sends me strong consolations, but is that what I want? Ought I not rather to be reproved for my deadness and coldness? I pray as if I did not pray, hear as if I did not hear and read as if... I did not read. Such is my deadness and coldness. I had a glorious revival on Saturday and Sunday. When I can do anything, I am not quite so dead. 
Oh, what a horrible state. It seems as if no real child of God could ever look on so coldly on and think so little of that the love of Jesus and his glorious atonement. Why is not my heart always warm? Is it not because of my own sins? I fear, at least this deadness be, but the prelude to death, spiritual death. I have still a sense of my own weakness, nothingness, and utter inability to do anything in and of myself. I pray God that I may never lose it. I am sure I must if left to myself, and then when I am cut off from him, in whom my great strength lieth, I shall be taken by the Philistines in my own wicked heart, and have mine eyes forever closed to all spiritual good. Pray for me, O my dear father and mother. O that Jesus would pray for me. Then I shall be delivered and everlastingly saved. I should like to always be reading my Bible and be daily gaining greater insight into it by the help of the Spirit. I can get but very little time as Mr. S. pushes me on in Greek and French. I have come to a resolution that, by God's help, I will profess the name of Jesus as soon as possible if I may be admitted into his church on earth. It is an honor, no difficulty. Grandfather encourages me to do so, and I hope to do so both as a duty and privilege. I trust that I shall then feel that the bounds of the Lord are upon me and have a more powerful sense of my duty to walk circumspectly. Conscience has convinced me that it is a duty to be buried with Christ in baptism, although I am not sure, I am sure it constitutes no part of salvation. I am very glad that you have no objection to my doing so. Mr. Swindell is a Baptist. You must have been terribly frightened when the chimney fell down. What a mercy that number hurt. There was a great deal of damage here from the wind. My cold is about the same as it was at home. It has been worse. I take all the care I can. I suppose it will go away soon. How are all the little ones? Give my love to them and to Archer and Eliza. How does Archer get on? Accept my best love for yourself and father. I hope you are well and remain your affectionate son, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. New Market, March 12, 1850. My dear father, many thanks to you for your kind, instructive, and unexpected letter. My very best love to dear mother. I hope she will be better soon. At our last church meeting, I was proposed. No one had been to see me yet. I hope that now I may be doubly circumspect and doubly prayerful. How could a Christian live happily, or live at all, if he had not the assurance that his life is in Christ and to support the Lord's undertaking? I am sure I would not have dared to take this great decisive step. Were it not that I am assured that omnipotence will be my support and that the shepherd of Israel my constant protector. Prayer is to me now what the suckling of the milk was to me in my infancy. Although I do not always feel the same relish for it, yet I am sure I cannot live without it. When by sin overwhelmed, shame covers my face. I look unto Jesus who saves by his grace. I call on his name from the gulf of despair, and he plucks me from hell in answer to prayer. Prayer, sweet prayer, be it ever so feeble, there is nothing like prayer. Even the sloth of despond cannot can be passed by the support of prayer and faith. Blessed be the name of the Lord, despondency has vanished. Like a mist before the sun of righteousness, who has shone into my heart. True to God is good to Israel. In the blackest darkness I resolved that, if I never had another ray of comfort, and even if I was everlasting lost, yet I would love Jesus and endeavor to run in the way to, of his commandments. From the time that I was enabled thus to resolve, all these clouds have fled. If they return, I fear not to meet them in the strength of the Beloved. One trial to me is that I have nothing to give up for Christ, nothing wherein to show my love to Him. What I can do is little, and what I do do is less. The tempter says, you don't leave anything for Christ, you only follow Him to be saved by it. What are your evidences? Then I tell him that I have given up my self-righteousness, and he says, yes, but not till you saw it was filthy rags. All I have to answer is that my sufficiency is not of myself. Thursday afternoon. I have just now received a very nice note from my dear mother. Many thanks to you for the P.O. order. I do not know what money obligations are imposed upon members. I must do as they tell me. I am glad, brother and sister, are better. Again, my best love to you all. I am, dear father, your affectionate son, Charles. New Market, April 6, 1850. My dear father, you will be pleased to hear that last Thursday night I was admitted as a member. Oh, that I may henceforth live more for the glory of him by whom I feel assured that I shall be everlastingly saved. Owing to my scruples on account of baptism, I did not sit down at the Lord's table and cannot in conscience do so until I am baptized. To one who does not see the necessity of baptism, it is perfectly right proper to partake of this blessed privilege. But were I to do so, I conceive would be to tremble, tumble over the wall, since I feel persuaded it is Christ's appointed way of professing him. I am sure this is the only view which I 
have of baptism. I detest the idea that I can do a single thing towards my own salvation. I trust that I feel sufficiently the corruption of my own heart to know that. Instead of doing one iota to forward my own salvation, my old corrupt heart would impede it, were it not that my Redeemer is mighty and works as he pleases. Since last Thursday I have been unwell in body, but I may say that my soul has been almost in heaven. I have been able to see my title clear and to know and believe that sooner than one of God's little ones shall perish, God himself will cease to be. Satan will conquer the King of Kings and Jesus will no longer be the Savior of the elect. Doubts and fear may soon assail me, but I will not dread to meet them if my Father has so ordained. He knows best. Were I never to have another vision of grace and, all, and be always doubting from now until the day of my death, yet the foundation of the Lord standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. I see now the secret, how it was that you were enabled to bear up under all your late trials. This faith is far more than any of us deserve. All beyond hell is mercy, but this is a mighty one. Were it not all of sovereign, electing, almighty grace, I, for one, could never hope to be saved. God says, you shall, and not all the devils in hell let loose upon a real Christian can stop the workings of God's sovereign grace. For in due time the Christian cries, I will. Oh, how little love have I for one who has thus promised to save me by so great a salvation, and who will certainly perform his promise. I trust that the Lord is working among my track people and blessing my little effort. I have had most interesting and encouraging conversation with many of them. Oh, that I could see but one sinner constrained to come to Jesus. How I long for the time when it may please God to make me, like you, my father, a successful preacher of the gospel. I almost envy you your exalted privilege. May the dew of Hermon and the increase of the Spirit rest upon your labors. Your unworthy son tries to pray for you and, and his mother, that grace and peace may be with you. Oh, that the God of mercy would incline Archer's heart to him and make him a partaker of his grace. Ask him if he will believe me when I say that one drop of the pleasure of religion is worth 10,000 oceans of the pleasures of the unconverted. And then ask him if he is not willing to prove the fact by experience. Give my love to my dear mother, as Mr. Kant Lowe's baptizing season will come around this month. I have humbly to beg your consent, as I will not act against your will and should very much like to commune next month. I have no doubt of your permission. We are all in Christ Jesus. Forms and ceremonies, I trust, will not make us divided. With my best love and hopes that you are all well, I remain your affectionate son, not only in the flesh but in the, in the faith. Christ, er, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Newmarket, April 20th. My dear mother, I have every morning looked for a letter from Father. I long for an answer. It is now a month since I have had one from him. Do, if you please, send me either permission or refusal to be baptized. I have been kept in painful suspense. This is the 20th, and Mr. Cantlow's baptizing day is to be the latter end of the month. I think next week. I should be so sorry to lose another ordination Sunday. And with my present convictions, I hope I shall never so violate my conscience as to sit down unbaptized. When requested, I assured the members at the church meeting that I would never do so. I often think of you poor starving creatures following Mr. for the bony rhetoric and oratory with which he gives you. What a mercy that you are not dependent upon him for spiritual comfort. I hope you will soon give up following that empty cloud without rain, that type and shadow preacher, for I don't think there is much substance. But, my dear mother, why do you not go and hear my friend Mr. Langford? He is an open communion Baptist, and I have no doubt will receive you without baptism. Perhaps his preaching may be blessed to Archer, Eliza, and my sisters, as well as to myself. Would it not be worthy giving up a little difference of persuasion for? God can save whom he will, when he will, and where he will. But I think Mr. Mount Sinai Warrens are the last thing to do it, to all human appearance. I think I might date this letter from a place in the enchanted ground, with the warm air of Beulah blowing up upon me. One drop of pleasures I have felt is worth a life of agony. I am afraid of becoming satisfied with this world. My very best love to yourself, dear father, Eliza Archer, Emily, Louisa, and Lottie. I hope you are well. I am very much better. Thanks for the prescription. And with my love to you again, I remain, dear mother, your affectionate son, Charles. P.S. If baptized, it will be in an open river. 
go in just as I am with some others. I trust a good confession before many witnesses will be a bond betwixt me and my master, my savior, and my king. New Market, May 1st, 1850. My dear mother, many very happy returns on your birthday. In this incident, my wish will certainly be realized, for in heaven you are sure to have an eternity of happy days. May you and your coming years live beneath the sweet smiles of the God of peace. May joy and singing attend your footsteps to a blissful heaven of rest and tranquility. Your birthday will now be doubly memorable, for on the 3rd of May, the boy of whom you have so often prayed, the boy of hopes and fears, your firstborn, will join the visible church of the redeemed on earth, and will bind himself doubly to the Lord his God by open profession. You, my mother, have been the great means in God's hands of rendering me what I hope I am. Your kind, warning, Sabbath evening addresses were too deeply settled on my heart to be forgotten. You, my God's blessing, prepared the way for the preached word and for that holy book, The Rise and Progress. If I have any courage, if I feel prepared to follow my Savior, not only into the water, but should he call me, even into the fire, I love you as the preacher to my heart is, is such courage as my praying, watching mother. Impossible, I think it is, that I should ever cease to love you, or you to love me, yet not so nearly so impossible as that the Lord, our Father, should cease to love either of us, be we ever so doubtful of it, or ever so disobedient. I hope you may one day have cause to rejoice, should you see me, the unworthy instrument of God, preaching to others. Yet have I vowed in the strength of my own strength, in the name of my beloved, to devote myself forever to his cause. Do you think it would be a bad beginning where I knowing it to be my duty to be baptized or shrink from it. If you are now as happy as I am, I can wish no more that you may continue so. I am the happiest creature, I think, upon this globe. I hope you have enjoyed your visit and that it will help much to establish your health. I dare not ask you to write, for I know you are always so busy that it is quite a task to you. I hope my letter will not pain you, dear mother. My best love to you, be assured that I would not do anything to grieve you, and I am assured that I remain your affectionate son, Charles Haddon. Mr. and Mrs. Swindell's um, respects to you and dear father. New Market Academy, June 11, 1850. My dear mother, many thanks to you for your valuable letter. Your notes are so few and far be between and are such a trouble to you that one now and then is quite a treasure. Truly, indeed, I have much for which to bless the Lord when I contemplate his divine sovereignty and see that my salvation is entirely of his free electing love. He has chosen me to be one of his vessels of mercy, and despite all opposition from without and from within, he will surely accomplish his own work. I have more than sufficient to induce me to give up myself entirely to him who has bought me and purchased me with an everlasting redemption. I am now enabled to rely upon his precious promises and to feel that I am as safe, though not so holy as the greatest saint in heaven. I have had two opportunities of addressing the Sunday school children, and have endeavored to do so as a dying being to dying beings. I am bound to New Market by holy bonds. I have 70 people whom I regularly visit on Saturday. I do not give a track and go away, but I sit down and endeavor to draw their attention to spiritual realities. I have great reason to believe the Lord is working. The people are so kind and so pleased to see me. I cannot bear to leave them. We are so feeble here that the weakest cannot be spared. We have a pretty good attendance at prayer meetings, but so few praying men that I am constantly called upon. One of our deacons, Mr. is constantly inviting me to his house. He is rather an Armenian, but so are the majority of the New Market Christians. Grandfather has written to me. He does not blame me for being a Baptist but hopes I shall not be one of the tight-laced, strict communion sort. In that we are agreed. I certainly think we ought to forget such things in others when we come to the Lord's table. I can and hope I shall be charitable to unbaptized Christians, though I think they are mistaken. It is not a great matter. Men will differ. We ought both to follow our own consciences and let others do the same. I think the time would be better spent in talking about the vital goodness than in disputing about forms. I trust the Lord is weaning me daily from self, all self-dependency and teaching me to look at myself as less than nothing. I know that I am perfectly dead without Him. It is His work. I am confident that He will accomplish it, and that I shall see the face of my Beloved in His own house in glory. My enemies are many, and they hate me with cruel hatred. Yet, with Jehovah Jesus on my side, why should I fear? I will march on in His, his almighty strength to assert conquest and victory. 
I am so glad that Sarah, too, is called, that two of us in one household at one time should thus openly profess the Savior's name. We are brother and sister in the Lord. May our Father often give each of us the refreshing visits of his grace. I feel as if I could say with Paul, Would that I were even accursed, so that my brethren according to the flesh might be saved. What a joy if God should prove that they are redeemed ones included in the covenant of grace. I long to see your face and let your heart beat let my heart beat with yours while we talk of the glorious things pertaining to eternal life. My best love to you and Father. May the angel of the covenant dwell with you and enchant you by the visions of his grace. Love to um, Eliza, Archer, many happy returns to him, Emily, Lottie, and Louisa. May they become members of the church in our house. I am very glad you are so well. I am so but hard at work for the examination, so allow me to remain your most affectionate son, Charles. Master H. shall be attended to. Be ye always ready for every good work. I have no time, but it shall be done.